Do I need NAS? What's the price difference really? What do all these crazy numbers mean? Which one of these works for me? We want speeds like this that's fail safe even if a drive goes bad that can be used by everybody in the house and you can see your files anywhere in the world. Network attached storage is the way to do this. Network attached storage acts like Google Drive or iCloud that you control. It works a lot faster since it's over your own network to the point where you can just leave your files on the NAS and edit from it anywhere in your house. So if you hate iCloud or Google Drive, this is the fastest way to get rid of it completely. You can access your files anywhere in the world as well, but to work from, this is great in an office with lots of people working on the same project or if you just like to move rooms. Get a bunch of hard drives, stick them in a box like this, and it runs like its own separate computer just for your files. You will need to buy, one, some hard drives to put all of this on. I need to buy four of them because of the trick I'm doing that allows me to get the super fast read and write speeds since I'm a video editor. Two, a NAS unit, which you can get on the internet or Amazon. All these weird wacky numbers, what do they all mean? Does the price difference even matter? Right away you'll see there's different sizes to 2 bay, 4 bay, 6 bay. These are empty when you buy them. You buy your own hard drives to put in here. First of all, your hard drives can't just be regular old hard drives. You gotta use one specifically made for server use, which is running around the clock, built to work under heavy loads. You can try to use the normal ones, it's just not gonna run as well. So trust me, just get these. They can't be random sizes either. They've all gotta match. So I've got four, four terabyte drives. That's what I'm putting in this one. My other RAID unit that I edit from has 48 terabytes. Oh, that's an enormous, unfathomable amount of space. Yes, and it was expensive. And that's why they don't come pre-built because you will need to decide which hard drives you want to put in these things. Which NAS unit do we pick? Well, the big brands are Synology is the most famous one, but I think they're kind of like Apple for network stuff. They make a good product, have good software, but like, I mean, double the price. So they've kind of gotten arrogant lately, so I don't want that. TerraMaster, QNAP. This one's a Ugreen. Ugreen came out of nowhere, like every tech YouTuber on earth has been sent one of these units to review. That would be a problem, except everywhere this thing is getting super high reviews. I haven't read a bad thing about a Ugreen, and I mean, everybody who's used one is super happy with it. And they're putting a lot of pressure on, on everybody else making these things because it's like a, a lot of hardware. I know that mine has compatibility with pretty much every, like a million different brands of hard drive, so I'm, I'm fine with whatever I wanna put in here. And if I wanna put up to 136 terabytes bytes in this thing. That is insane. It'll take that capacity. That's like, so 47 million photos is what that is equivalent to, or 92,000 movies. And it caught my attention because it's so much bang for your buck. So I'm going with the Ugreen. Any one of these will work fine though, because they all work kind of the same. They all act like their own little computer. You can control your file separately just from the unit. All of them have their own build and software that kind of makes it idiot proof when you're starting up. That's why it's expensive. It's like a tiny little computer. They've all got processors in them and RAM for running all your applications and stuff inside of there. They can install apps to do cool things like watching movies or music, organizing photos. You can set up users with passwords that can access it anywhere there's internet, anywhere in the world. You can set them up to be accessed anywhere in the world. They automatically back up your files, so they kind of do a lot for the money. And what's important to me as an editor, you can build them in RAID, which I will explain later, but you build it so that if one of these drives fails, you can just replace that one drive and it'll replace all the data that was lost off of that based off of the clues from the other hard drives. So the redundancy is really important. If one drive fails, it's not the end of the world. Just put a new one in and it'll replace the data. When you build it like this, you also get way faster read and write speeds because it's all of the hard drives working together as one. If you went balls out and bought the most expensive NAS out there, would you notice a big difference? Not really if you're just a dad who's putting his backup movies and files on there on the weekends. The cheaper, smaller, quieter ones will do the same thing pretty much that the bigger, noisier ones will do. If it's just videos of your kids on the weekend, it's not a big deal. If you just want to be able to look at your files anywhere, they'll all do that fine. I'm a video editor and I've got, I, I will just abuse this thing as much as I can. I need it to be very fast and I need to have tons of room. When you're talking about 4K, 6K files in broadcast formats, they're, they're enormous files. So I will stress this thing out and that's why I need the really good specs. But the expensive ones also are built for a lot of users in like a huge office, like 30 computers running off of this thing with like firewalls and passwords, a bunch of other wacky IT vocabulary. If that's what you need, you're not watching this video anyway. Some of these specs. There's a processor in it. And again, the apps aren't very costly to run either way. So this isn't going to make a huge difference. All of them kind of perform near the same. Oh, let's just get this TerraMaster. It's only $200. That's because it's just a disk enclosure. It's not a NAS. You want it to say NAS. So it's the thing that connects over the network and does all the other stuff. The RAM, will you notice a difference? Probably not because eight gigabytes, which is what comes with mine, is plenty to run everything you're trying to do inside of this little machine. If you upgraded that RAM, which you can add to this unit and went to like 64 gigabytes, the biggest difference you would notice is that transferring files would use that RAM to transfer first. So it would be super fast on those 64 gigabytes. And 
then it would switch to normal transfer speed for the rest of it when it's running off the hard drives again. So it uses it like temporary space when you're transferring files. Helpful, not the end of the world. On this one specifically, you can add an NVMe solid state drive. So this is like the size of a stick of gum and you can tell it to use it as a catch. So the first one terabytes will be really fast and then it'll switch over to the regular hard drives for the rest of the space. If you wanted to buy one of these off of Amazon, it's like a terabyte for $60. So that little upgrade is very cool to have the option. I'm not doing it here though. Most of these will have 2.5 gigabit ethernet, but just make sure it has that. That's just internet speed and you want a port that can handle up to three or 400 megabytes. You might not need it, but you don't want to be limited by this. If it says one, you don't want that. How much hard drive space do you need? You can figure this out. I've got tons of four terabyte drives that are filled and laying around. And what pressured me to get RAID to begin with was filling up those drives and it getting more and more expensive. If you've got four terabytes full and you're really getting sweaty over this, you know that 12 terabytes is going to be tons of space for you. I already had 12 terabytes and that was me like holding back. So I don't ever want to have to think about it again. That's why I got the massive 48 terabyte one as my first one. If you take away one thing from this video, my biggest warning, this is something you just have to accept is expensive, sucks, and get it over with. You are doing this to get rid of this problem forever. You do not want to be in a position where you skimp out, get 12 terabytes, and then in a couple of years, those are full. So two years later, you've just punted it down the road. Now you've got to go commit to 48 terabytes or whatever, 20 terabytes, an even bigger one. That's going to be the same price all over again from the beginning, building a brand new RAID thing and transferring all of that onto this one. And then you've got a bunch of useless hard drives you aren't using anymore. Don't put yourself in that position. You want to do this to never worry about it again and have so much storage that it's the last thing you're worried about. So yes, spend a little bit more this time to avoid paying double later on and all of this first purchase being a waste. And one more itty bitty with the problem. If you are doing the RAID setup I talked about to get super fast transfer speeds, you have got to sacrifice one of these drives to the RAID gods. That's how it works. When they all work together, they, they dance around a fire and chant and then one of them's up on a pole and they let's set it on fire and sacrifice this thing. Three of these drives will be for storage. One of them is going to be for the backup thing. So if I have four, four terabyte drives, I'm only going to wind up with 12 terabytes in the end. Having done it on 12 terabyte disks, it, I don't regret it one bit. Absolutely worth every penny once you see the speeds on this thing, but not just the speed, redundancy. If one of them fails, you're fine. That The peace of mind is so important. Before you get into all of this too, one really huge warning I want you to consider. These drives work at massive speeds, which is great, but you have probably one really Really huge choke point in your house. That is your modem. This unit connects to the rest of your network over ethernet. This one specifically has a whopping 10 gigabit per second ethernet port. That is a huge amount of data, but it has to go through your router to get to the rest of the internet and your house. Your modem more than likely caps out at one. <laughs> one gigabit per second. It's a 10 lane highway that could do 1200 megabytes per second download upload speeds and it gets choked down to a two lane bottleneck right in the middle. Even if the other side is four lanes, it doesn't matter because we're only going a couple of cars at a time thanks to that giant bottleneck in the middle. I have a Cox modem router combo and every one of these ethernet ports caps out at one. So that is the bottleneck. Anybody on Wi-Fi or just over your network connected directly can access this at more than 120 megabytes per second. Instead, what I do, plug this directly into your computer. So run the ethernet cable from the back of this over to your computer, then you'll get much faster speeds. The second issue, does your computer have a 10 gigabit per second ethernet port? Probably not. I mean, really freaking unlikely that it does. It's probably one. And even if you have a nice one, like um, the motherboard I have, it has 2.5. So the most I can do is like three to 400 megabytes per second transfer speeds. If you divide the megabits by eight, you get the megabytes. Somebody thought this was a great idea and not confusing at all. I don't know why they, anyway, just pause if you need this little conversion chart. If you have a lame boring computer, it's probably gonna have a one gigabit ethernet port as well. To figure this out on your start menu, type in system info. This will pull up all your systems information right in the middle. Baseboard product is where it shows this. This is my model number, so I just Google it. Then when the page comes up for my motherboard, I can see right here in the middle, 2.5 gigabyte ethernet. I didn't even have to go look in the specs. It's right there. 2.5 gigabit ethernet is plenty though. It's gonna give me almost the exact same speed as what I'm making, which is a RAID 5 hard drive assembly. So this is plenty. The other thing you have to consider 
is that Wi-Fi will slow this thing down. It's not gonna be as fast as a direct connection. So on my MacBook Pro, when I connect it directly to this, transferring over just Finder, I'm getting like 80 megabytes per second, which is great. 80 megabytes up and down, awesome. For most things you're doing, I mean, transferring, backing up stuff, awesome. But if I wanna edit this, I want it to be faster. So one thing you could do is from Cox or whoever you're with, try to find a router or modem that does more than one gigabit per second. More than likely, it's gonna be 2.5. That's like the next step up. That's like the high quality ones and that even still it gives you a three or four hundred megabytes per second maximum which is great and then if it has wi-fi 7 it'll be faster over the network and maybe your transfer speeds will be better but you want to give yourself the best hardware that way i know this is all sounding like costing a lot more money so i wouldn't even focus on using it that way i would just use it as great to have but if i want the real speed the easiest way is just plugging it directly into your computer over an ethernet cable your other option crack open your computer spend like 60 bucks on a network interface card that is built for 10 gigabits per second ethernet. So I'm sticking one in my computer so that I can plug in directly to this thing and get those 10 gigabits per second. You've only got to worry about one thing that way. I don't have to call Cox, worry about a modem router, deal with all of that mess. I'm just plugging this straight into the computer when I need to work at top speed. If you get a different unit than the Ugreen, you might have the option to plug in USB-C. So check that first because if you can just plug in your USB-C and plug into your computer, that's a good alternative, but I'm not sure what your unit has. Again, beware of the Thunderbolt thing though because it looks like USB-C but it's faster and it's a different setup. So make sure it doesn't say that in the specs. You want to know what you can transfer over or just like look up the reviews or something. Building these things is extremely simple. All of them are idiot proof. The bays make the cutest noise when you pop them open. The bays slide out, you stick your hard drive in this thing, and this bracket on this model has these cool little things that pop out and hold the hard drive for you. Thank god I don't have to freaking fight with this stupid thing because I usually hate these. Stick in all four hard drives, plug it in with ethernet and turn it on. Your instructions will tell you how to plug this thing in. Mine is just go to a website and then click connect and it'll find it on the network automatically. Make an account and a password and whatnot, you're not stupid, you can figure this part out. You can skip all of this, but if you're new, there's a tour of how everything works. Nothing so far has been overwhelming for somebody who's never done this before. It's all like shapes and colors. This is doable for any IT heavy five-year-old. Now we have our first big decision about what to do with these hard drives. You can make a decision right away to leave them how they are. It's going to combine all of them to make one big pile of data. So you're going to get normal hard drive speed that way. In that case, click JBOD, which is just a bunch of dicks. Again, if you only have a one gigabit per second modem, it doesn't matter. Just do that because hard drive speed is about the same speed as what the ethernet will give you. You can skip this whole next section about RAID, but if you want this thing to be really fast, we're going to do something different. It shows you different RAID types and the amount of data you'll have in the end if you click on that one. I'm choosing RAID 5 because you have the speed, but you also have redundancy, so if a drive fails, you're okay. Some of these, like RAID 0, that's double the speed, but if either drive eventually goes bad, you lose all your data, so don't do that. If you need to go to the DMV, good news, you're about to have six free hours because that's how long it takes for this thing to compile RAID 5. You can still use your computer for other stuff though, because remember, the NAS is a separate unit. One more warning about RAID RAID 5. Let's say five years from now one of these discs does fail. With 16 terabytes, it's going to take days to rebuild that last disc. Better than losing your data, but just know that the bigger the hard drive, the longer it takes for things to fix if one goes bad. Another option with great speed is RAID 10. It would only take you like nine hours to fix a disc if one of them went bad in my situation with four terabytes. Let's go back to the chart though. The cost of that is half your data, and when these drives are expensive, like I don't want to do that. I'm just going to live on the edge with RAID 5. To make this visible to everybody, go to control panel and then file service. Under SMB, we need to enable SMB service. At the same time, we need to make sure the computer is open to socializing. So right click on network and internet settings down here. Click on ethernet, which is how we're connected. Make sure that it says private network and go back down to the bottom, advanced network settings, advanced sharing settings. This needs to say set up network devices automatically, network sharing is on, all of that is checked and fine. And it should be easy for Windows to see the device now. So open up a folder, click on network, and it should pop up with its name. If not, they also give you instructions very clearly right here. Just enter these numbers in a file explorer window right here in this bar up at the top. Let's test it out on a Mac now. The instructions say to click go, connect to server, here's the number that we need to type in, use your login and your password. This is over Wi-Fi, so let's test the speed on that 11 gigabyte file. I know it says 10, sorry. About 120 seconds, which is 90 megabytes per second. That's really good. I realize that means it also works the same way if you use the Files app on your iPhone. At the top right, you connect manually to a server, type in the same address they give you. iPhone also has no problem connecting. 
Now let's check the speed on my PC, but wait a minute. Because of our insulting one gigabit port on the router, I'm connected directly to the NAS. How am I gonna get internet? This part is very important. Go under file service, network connection, network bridging, normal bridging. Check this, LAN one, LAN two. Once again, doing a great job of making this simple for the average idiot. My computer will now use the 10 gigabit port on the NAS and the internet will go through the 2.5 gigabit port through my NAS onto my computer. Once the fusion dance is over, you have the combined power of both of these now and it tells you right here, network status 10 gigabits per second. First test from the NAS, read speed 11 gigabyte file to my computer. It took 35 seconds, 315 megabytes per second. Take two, uploading to the NAS, write speed. It took 30 seconds, so 366 megabytes per second we're about capping out at the 2.5 gigabit ethernet port at this point. The interface lets you install apps onto the NAS, so you have this little group right here of what the popular ones are, so you're not confused by all this huge list down here of what to get. Obvious ones, photo, video, you can set up backups on here to back up your computer. A huge surprise, for whatever reason, they just knocked the Photos app out of the park. This thing has an AI organizer thing built in. In the software, if you just type in people, places, dogs, you know, boat, it'll go through your 47 million photos and find that for you. If you're superstitious, you don't have to have that feature turned on. You can install it. This is a surprise that I'm looking at raw format photos. I mean, just with thumbnails loaded and everything, I don't even get that by default from Windows. For any users who get this thing, but you have way too much Google memorabilia laying around your house to turn back now, you can keep Google Drive. This thing hilariously will sync with Google Drive. So you don't have to like download all your files, organize them and then upload them here. Google Drive will go straight onto the NAS. If at some point one of your underlings becomes worthy, you can bless them with with access with the username and password and you control this too so you can separate the stuff that they can see and what you can see it's also cool to be able to reject users once they have crossed you and conspired with your enemies and you can just remove them from your NAS with the security if I can add users to my NAS and they're using it at the same time I can be shooting in Africa and it's being edited at the same time in the same place by my editor in Antarctica once you activate it they give you all the instructions right here and your address that you can use so you can copy this to any browser then once you get over here it's just the same login so anywhere you get the same dashboard it's not like a watered down version i like that i have not found anything or felt anything that made me feel like they haven't been doing this for 10 years when a brand name pops up overnight and you try them out it's kind of iffy you don't know if, if it's going to be janky weird things start happening that you can't really explain but you know something's wrong like your device is haunted i haven't had any of that everything works super easy i think the price also and the software is going to invite a lot of people who were kind of overwhelmed with this kind of stuff before into using these things and i mean when i started doing this it, it was much harder Harder. you had to know so much technical stuff and now it's like a pretty smooth road to getting it to work fine the end